This is episode 139 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world every single week. I am so excited about my guest today. When I first started doing magic some 25 years ago, he was already a legend. So many magicians on this show have credited him and his magic mystery school for their successes. Listen carefully. You're going to hear pearls of wisdom throughout the entire interview. Enjoy the show. I definitely enjoyed this interview. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He fooled Penn and Teller. He was awarded Magic Castle's Magician of the Year. He was inducted into the Society of American Magicians Hall of Fame. Performer, author, teacher, he's the man behind the mask. Here he is, the Grand Master of Magic, Jeff McBride. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be able to share some of my insights uh, with the magic and performing community. I'm excited to talk to you. Now, last night, ironically, I saw Kiss. So last night, I saw a bunch of guys with masks. And today, I am interviewing the Master of Mask Manipulation, Jeff McBride himself. How about that? I think the uh, that era of the 70s and 80s with Alice Cooper and David Bowie and Kiss really influenced my style. I oh. think we're all trying to be larger than life and to create characters and personas that could take people out of a mundane world and put them in a magical world. And I think each in our own way, we've accomplished that. And I even got to be Alice Cooper's opening act. Is that true? Absolutely true in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Yep. I just saw Alice Cooper. Oh, right before COVID, right before COVID happened. So that's interesting. You know, when I, when I saw that, I thought of you a little bit in that it's the first time I'd ever seen Kiss. Every single thing they do, you think guitar shred, they did that. You think wild pyrotechnics, they did that. You think crazy costumes, they did that. Everything you can think of in a concert, they did. So I thought of you. I would want to create a performance that is unlike any other magical performer they've seen. One of the things that I've always been encouraged to do by my teachers is to be different, be uncommon, tap into my passions. And one of the things that I learned early on is to combine my passions with my art. And I love martial arts and I love pantomime and I love masks and I love dance and I love drumming. And I took all of these theatrical disciplines and I combined them with my magic, my martial arts training. These are the things that set me apart from the rest of the pack. You know, if a magician comes out on stage and just does the same old, same old and tells little jokes, people are going to tune out. When I was evolving my show, I really wanted to engage the audiences on many different levels. Visually, I wanted to connect with them mythically, magically. So I combined all of these these different theatrical elements. And I'm still encouraging my students to tap into their passions and combine them, their passions with their magic, because that's what makes them different. The kind of the most important thing, I know you've had a lot of people through your magic school. Do you find out what their individual strengths and weaknesses are and uh, have them expand on, on that, on what their strengths are? Well, something to set them apart that's a little bit different. And I have one student that came to me years ago. His name was Aaron Crow, and he was very interested in martial arts. So we featured that samurai sword, and we put together some numbers for him that featured weapons because that was a thing that fascinated him. I have another student in the UK. His name is Paul Craven. Yeah. He is very interested in the origins of golf, Scottish golf. And he does a whole show that talks about his passion for golf and specifically this kind of antique style golf. And he's formed a niche market. I have other students that are interested in psychology and they are psychological illusionists. I have a young magician student of my name, Elliot Hunter, who is just graduated engineering school. And he used his magic to put himself through engineering school and paid off his tuition with use, with his magic act. But he's combining his passion for design and engineering and innovation and creativity into his magic. And that's what's going to set him apart. I have another student named James Ember, 
who is a professional chef and loves magic. And he's the kitchen magician. And he does magic with, you know, kitchen supplies. Yeah. Because everybody cooks, everybody eats. That's and right. connects with people. So it's finding what people are passionate about and connecting it to the magic. That makes so much sense because on two levels, first, it's something you're passionate about, something that you love. So that's going to come out in your performance. But secondly, it's something you know about. Well, first, you have to learn your craft and you have to train in magic and get good at performing and then pour your heart and soul into it the way that David Copperfield combined his love for movies and musical theater and storytelling. That's what set him apart is because those things were important to him. Penn and Teller, they have a point of view that is skeptical, that they are kind of watchmen for unscrupulous activities opposing as a psychic investigators, and, and, and they, they look into that world. They present their skeptical point of view, which informs their magic. You know, I, I think of Matt Franco. Matt Franco is really good with playing cards. That's his passion. He's primarily a card magician. However, he brings that intensity and passion to all of his magic. Since a very early age, you know, he showed up at our magic and mystery school at 12 years old with a manipulation act. And he took his passion for card manipulation, manipulation, and parlayed it into a college show. And then got his audition on America's Got Talent and took his manipulation skills and storytelling skills to, to now have his own Las Vegas show. He won America's Got Talent, right? Well, you know, in the past few years, two of the winners, you know, Shin Lim and uh, Matt Franco have won because of their passion for playing cards. A lot of magicians go, oh, playing cards. Oh, if I see another card trick. Well, guess what? The American public has proved that they love card magic. Two, two of the you know, like greatest entertainers in the world perform card magic. Sure, it's funny. Whenever I, I pull out a deck of cards, I, I do a lot of children's magic. If, if you listen to this podcast at all, you'll know that I that I do a ton of children's magic. And every time I take out a deck of cards, all the kids, a lot of the kids yell out, oh, I know that trick. I know that trick. Like there's one card trick. There, there, there's only one. I, I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, young kids want to show other kids how clever they are and how worldly they are by just saying that they know something because they learn from their parents or siblings that, if they know something, that's social status. That's another dynamic behind that. However, uh, at my core, I started as a family entertainer. Oh. And one of the big pieces in my show, that's one of the signature pieces, is my coin routine with a young person from the audience, which sure. some people call the miser's dream, but it's not a dream and it's not about a miser. It's about the sorcerer's apprentice and it's kind of a, an initiation of a, a young person from the audience to access their own magical powers. And I have been doing that coin routine with a person from the audience longer than anything in my show. Now, now what do you find are the biggest mistakes that entertainers do? Magic, I, I feel, is a in, really incredible personal experience. And I encourage students of the art to connect in real time with real people to gain real experience into the art of magic. But I think a lot of cop out from today's YouTube generation is, oh, I can't read books. I'm a visual learner. And I think that's an incredible cop out because there's just so such limited information on magic that's available. And the real secrets are on, in, the peop, in, in the books and the real secrets are in the people. Connect that's with right. them and, and read their books. A YouTube clip takes minutes to shoot and upload. A book takes years. Yeah, not only that, but when somebody either, either even writing it in print or putting it on YouTube, that person that has done that has done a thousand performances since they wrote that. And they've learned a thousand different things. Uh, so they have a wealth of experience that you can learn from. Agreed, agreed. Connecting with lifetime teachers, I think is really important. And that's where people like you really shine because you are teaching the next generation magic through your project, through your Discover Magic and, and your, your other outlets online. You know, they, they're having a real interface with a person that has had experience. So I really encourage that. Seek out somebody nearby or get a mentor, even if it's online. I spend, I spend a great deal of time every week helping coaching people from all around the world that just can't 
make it to Las Vegas to our magic school because of you know the recent past years, everybody knows how to get online and study on Zoom. Now I have been teaching online every week for 11 years. Oh. Every week. We have many free programs. If you go to McBrideMagic.tv, you'll see Mystery School Monday. And the first Monday of every month, we have a free episode. And it's with people like Max Maven or Bob Neal was last week, the great philosopher magician. David Copperfield's done in-depth uh, interviews on the show. Many of the major personalities in magic are guests on the show. And it's a really deep show. It's not just about tricks. It's about the truth behind the tricks and how to add meaning to our magic. And that's sure, one sure. of the things that we are really big on is taking the eye candy of magic and transforming it into soul food. That's really what our magic and mystery school is about. After you have enough tricks, come to us and we can teach you the way we have found to take your personality, to take your life experience, to take your stories and use the magic routines that you already know to tell these effective stories to touch and move your audiences. Yeah, well, well what's the best advice you personally have ever gotten? Not all laughs are good laughs is one, it's just one, it's not the most. There is not one, the most important piece of philosophy. But Eugene Berger, who is the world's foremost philosopher on magic, I had the opportunity to work with him for over 30 years. Yeah. And a lot of magicians will go for the quick laugh at the expense of the person. Not all laughs are good laughs. They might get the laugh in the moment, but they might offend the person or give the audience a conflicting narrative about your show. I'll give you a case in point. Sure. If you're a storytelling magician and you're trying to have people connect with you, I, you know, a person could open a line with like, well, I grew up, you know, very poor. My parents were in the iron and steel business. My mother irons and my father steals. <laughs> well, you got to laugh, but no one can trust your narrative now because you're going to pull the rug out for them for the cheap laugh. So you can't really tell a heartfelt story because the people aren't going to believe it because you just blew your credibility with one joke. Right. Right. So we have to be very careful about this. And I had a very interesting talk with Noel Breton uh, from England, who's very, very uh, deeply educated in the art of magic and comedy. He goes, a lot of magicians fall on hack lines because they see them, they hear them, they see them on YouTube and they go for the hack line. Yeah. You know, yeah. The clean hand and all you know put out the clean hand stand on yeah. the track door and uh you know our friend paul draper who's one of the faculty of our school if you google hack lines that magician use <laughs> he and jason andrews did two videos covering every single one but what no Breton said which is so fascinating is that the reason magicians use hack lines is because they work they do get the laugh right they will get the laugh you know if if, if you come on stage with you know somebody applauds and you go oh thank you know one person applauds in the audience yeah. and you go oh, thanks mom that will get a laugh sure but it's also taking away one moment of your sincerity and one moment where you couldn't really put in your personality mm. so people put in hack lines and for every hack line there's a little bit of their soul missing they will get the laugh but they won't get what they might be able to get if they didn't, if they resisted right. or took them out and replaced them with something that was more original. Right. Replacing with something that forwards the story and increases your character or, or shows more of your character. Right. And I'm not saying that people can't do hack lines. I'm saying they have a choice. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Chipper Lowell and I just had this exact same uh, similar conversation of different types of laughs. Some laughs are, are offensive. Some people laugh because they're uncomfortable. Some people laugh, well, because it's a funny line, uh, but there are a number of different types of laughs and uh, just to go for the cheap laugh is, is no good. Correct. I know it's kind of off the subject, but tell us uh, maybe a crazy or fun story of yourself performing or one of your students. Well, any fun I, stories? I, <laughs> lots, you know, of stories, lots of stories. And one of my, I have a, a friend in uh, junior high school 
named Robert. And he sold me this little tiny plastic faucet. And it was one of the trick faucet that filled up with water. You would secretly fill it up with water, had a suction cup on it. And you would stick it to a wall and you could turn the little spigot and it would pour out water. So it was like you could you know, make water come out from anything. I thought it was so cool. Yeah. And I think I bought it for about 50 cents or a dollar. How old are you at the time? About? I'm like in eighth grade or something. Okay. Seventh, eighth grade. In English class. I remember right where I got it. I was like such a score. And I had this thing for a number of years and I put it in my act. I read about this great routine where I think I guess it was a Don Allen routine where you would put water in a can, put a piece of paper on it, turn it upside down and put it on a kid's head and then pull out the card and it says, do not remove this card. You'd pick up the can and that was it. Well, I thought it would be a great idea to stick the faucet on the kid's head, turn it on and the water come out. Yeah. And that was working fine for me for a couple of birthday parties. And I guess I'm 13 or 12 or 13 years old and I'm doing my friend Richard Rankin's bar mitzvah at the Landfill Avenue Synagogue in New York. It's like 1972 or 73, something like that. And I'm just killing, I'm doing my Fantasio candle, my milk pitcher, my temple screen, and now it's time for the big comedy number. And I get the kid up, cute little kid with a beetle haircut. And I put the can on his head, everyone's laughing. I pull the little sign out, everyone's laughing. Pull the can up, everyone's laughing. Sure. I stick the faucet on the kid's head. Water comes out from the, from the faucet, everyone's laughing. And I go to pull the faucet off and the kid goes, my stitches, my stitches, my oh, stitches. No. I picked the one kid in the entire audience who just happened to have hairline Frankenstein stitches. And that's why he grew his bangs down or combed his hair down. And so the stitches popped, the blood came down and oh, no. effectively the show was over. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Yeah. So nowadays, before I ever get a person on stage, I run a whole gamut of preconditioning tests to make sure that they are in full working order before <laughs> I invade their private space. I'm much more careful these days. I've learned a lot in the past 50 years. Yeah, I, I think we have to be careful. I've, I've had so many people on this show that have, um, I think it was um, oh, uh, uh, Craig Diamond talked about doing a routine with a hat and such and somebody's ear fell off his that, actual ear fell off you know, i just put a, a facebook post out yesterday i have a friend in south africa who and it's written up on my facebook page under a little post called tragic magic <laughs> uh, which is i'll tear what is today september 10th so it was a couple days yeah. ago 2021 if you want to look yeah. for it <laughs> and Jock, the, my friend Jacques, was doing a wristwatch steal and broke a girl's wrist. Oh. The irony of it is the mother and father were taking the girl out to celebrate getting her wrist cast taken off from a broken wrist. Oh no. So they took her out to a restaurant and the magician comes over and breaks her wrist. <laughs> Let's go to a happy place. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you want to hear about? Since we're learning all sorts of stuff from you right now, how can somebody learn more from your magic school? Well, you can learn a lot. You can go to magicalwisdom.com mm -hmm. and join the school. We have magic online magic classes every week that we cover different subjects. And we have over 550 hours of magic training in our archives on every possible subject from close-up magic to strolling magic to outdoor festival magic, trade shows, corporate shows, street magic, manipulation, history of women in magic, mentalism, grand illusion, every category covered by experts in their field. And we also have our pep talks, which are about philosophy, entertainment, and performance. And we have dozens of talks. They're like the TED Talks of magic. In fact, we've been doing our pep talks so long. Years ago, we had to try to describe and tell people what TED Talks were because TED Talks weren't popular. Yeah, We've been doing this a really long time. 
And we have some deep thinkers of magic and some incredible performers teaching at the school. And I give private coaching at all levels. I have some young students. I have some students that are retiring from their main job and now looking as magic as a second hobby or a second, you know, career. I have some students that are just deep thinkers and magic enthusiasts that have no desire to perform. They just want to deepen their understanding of magic. So uh, if you go to magicalwisdom.com, you can get all that information. Or if you're interested in contacting me about coaching, it's jeff at mcbridemagic.com. That's pretty simple. Jeff at mcbridemagic.com. Or you can reach me through my Facebook. I don't spend a lot of time on Instagram, Twitter, Twitter or TikTok <laughs> because it's just an incredible time waste. I would much yeah. rather be interfacing with real people in real time instead of watching people crash on skateboards and get into car accidents. Yeah, we do have a tendency to, to go down that rabbit hole if you, well, you're viewing yeah. that. Um, I, I encourage my, my, my students to turn off all notifications on their phone so it doesn't ping, beep, or buzz to pull them out of their practice. Because one of the greatest uh, interrupters of our practice is a cell phone distraction. And it takes us, it's proven, it takes us 10 or 20 minutes to get back into the flow state of practice. It's the oh, I believe it. Distraction. Yeah, one of, the, one of the tricks that I've used before is actually setting a timer for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever that is and practice up to that point in time. And that way you don't get tired and, and you, you do a power practice for that 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. Yes, well, it is. thank you. I, I, I won't take any more of your time, sir. Thank you for joining me today. I, I really enjoyed having you on here. It, it is a, it is an honor and a privilege, my friend. Well, wonderful and continued success sharing insights with professionals around the world about how we can empower each other's vision. And we'll see you at the Magic and Mystery School. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And listeners, go out and get those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.